Well, I should introduce you first of all. So I'm Philip from 11 Alive, and we have with us Lars Ulrich from the mighty Metallica. Lars, welcome to Atlanta. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to be here. Now, whenever you get your tour itinerary and you see Atlanta on there, what do you think? Um, I think uh, humidity. <laughs> We've had a lot of good times here over the years. It's always uh, hot. It's always humid. Uh, everybody's spirits are, are good here. Um, uh, Waffle House. Um, CNN. Have you had a lot of experiences with Waffle House? Uh, yes, I have actually. At uh, especially between three and five in the morning, uh, the Waffle House always seems to come in handy. When you when you travel around um, this beautiful country, um, there's lots of um, of uh, food uh, experiences that are uh, what I would call regional, mm -hmm. and uh, Waffle House is a particular it's a particular uh, regional experience to this part of the United States, and. Um, Back in the day when um, I was not quite as um, conscious of what I ate, no disrespect to the fine Waffle Houses, of course, uh, you know, Waffle House between, like I said, three to five in the morning was always good on the way back to the hotel. So um, obviously that's not the only thing I think about when I think of Atlanta, but that was the first thing that came to mind. Now, take us into the life of Lars Ulrich on a, on a day, a t typical touring day. So when do you get into Atlanta? What do you do when you get into Atlanta? And when do you, how long do you stay in the town? Do you see anything besides the venue? Um, well, I would say that there's no real typical day. Uh, they're all different. Um, but today, since you asked, it's Sunday. Uh, we woke up in Miami. Uh, we flew here. Uh, we landed um, 4.30. Uh, came here. I did an interview with the Washington Post. And I did a meet and greet. And now I'm talking to you. That's been my day so far. Uh, and then I'm going to go do another meet and greet, and then I'm going to get into sort of my uh, routine, as it's called. Um, I'm going to do a little kind of, uh, I usually do like a 15, 20 minute run, mm -hmm. do um, eat some protein, uh, get stretched, get a little bit of massage on my shoulder. It's kind of like a sports team, yeah. uh, unfortunately now, at our age. Uh, and then uh, we get together in a little room somewhere in the bowels of the stadium and um, warm up for about 30 minutes. Then we play the rock show, and then we're going to get straight off stage and go out to the airport and fly back to Miami, and I'll be in Miami for the next couple of days. Now, you're, you guys have structured your tours differently. You're doing it differently than, I guess, a lot of bands do and what you used to do in the sense that you're not going on the road for six months at one time, jumping on a bus. Instead, you do it like in spurts, like in two-week periods. What led to you making that change? Um, well... It, it's, first of all, we're all, uh, uh, we take uh, our domestic responsibilities very seriously. So we like to get home every couple of weeks, see our kids, see home. Uh, that's the, 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 the obvious reason. Uh, I think that um, uh, two other elements play into that. Um, at our age, uh, 35 years into our, our run, our career, whatever you want to call it, um, when you do them in shorter spurts, it's, it's just, uh, physically uh, healthier. Mm -hmm. Takes a lot out of our battered bodies to play these shows. And lastly, uh, mentally, um, when you do touring in shorter spurts, it's easier to, um, to sort of, I would say, the falling off the deep end factor mm -hmm. uh, that remains at a, at a, a lower percentage chance you know it, it's sort of like when you can when you go on the road for two weeks and you can kind of see the end mm -hmm. before you start it, it puts a, a different kind of spin on it and so for us the most important thing for us is 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 to be mentally healthy and physically healthy and so we look at that as the the priority and so we make an investment uh in in in, in sort of doing that and and so going on the road basically in two-week spurts is um, the best way to uh, minimize any kind of uh, derailing uh, of, the, uh, of the Metallica train. Now, you guys are in uncharted territory because you've been doing this for 35 years. Um, you're one of the few rock bands that can play a stadium these days. Uh, and you're playing heavy music, just about as heavy as ever. Physically, how I don't think there's ever been We've never, you know, the history of rock and roll has never really had a band that's reached this level where you're still playing this high. So you 
are going to be the first and maybe even the last to to attempt to play this sort of heavy music this far into your career? The last one? Uh, well, I don't know who would be coming up next. Perhaps some, there will be another rock band that plays this sort of heavy music that's, that's physically I so. demanding. Uh, I would hope so. Um, you know, the the whole last thing, that's a... Uh, that's a that's a well, that's a lot of weight to carry. Um, listen, it, uh, yes, I, I mean, all kidding aside, yes, we are obviously in somewhat uncharted territory. You know, I went to a desert trip last year out in California, and between the Stones and the Who and, and Roger Waters and 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 Paul McCartney and everybody who played, I mean, they're all north of seventy, or most of them are north of seventy, and doing phenomenal and doing great but obviously what we're doing has a, a different sense of physicality to it and, and a different set of, of physical um, requirement mm -hmm. uh, and yes so we are a little bit I hope we can do this another 20 years I hope we can do another 120 years yeah. but uh, the, the, the thing that separates us a little bit is that I think there's a point where uh, if we can't put the weight into it and put the the energy into the music that it deserves then it's maybe, and we don't know, this is the big question mark, it's maybe better to not do it mm -hmm. than to do it sort of half-assed. And that's the part we haven't gotten to yet. We haven't gotten to that fork in the road yet. Hopefully, we won't come to that fork in the road for some time, but um, obviously you're conscious of the fact that when you're north of 50 that um, you know the rotator cuff could go at any yeah. time. Yeah. Or um, I was reading an interview with one of the fellows in Anthrax, you know, uh, who, every, you know, one of the guys in Slayer had surgery. I mean, people have issues, and um, it, it, we just have to, to sort of face that fact. But hopefully we can keep this going for, for years, if not decades. Now, we are a news station here in Atlanta, and the face of news and the way that people consume news has completely changed in the past few no, years. has it? Absolutely. Yes, okay. So... We, we always have this philosophy of digital first, and the world of music has seen similar changes. We're in the sense that nowadays people want information, they want their music now, they don't want to wait for anything. How have you, I, I, for your latest album, Hardwired to Self Destruct, whenever you release the album, as an example of that, you guys chose to, to do videos and release videos for every one of your songs around the same time that the album came out. You've got streaming, you've got all these other things. How do you guys keep up with all the stuff that's going on? Um. Well, I think you you just you have to do your best. I mean, it's that simple. Yeah. You do your best, and um, you know the thing about releasing records nowadays compared to say twenty years ago or whatever is that that there was a formula, mm -hmm. there was kind of a a way that it had to be, and now there's no formula, so there's a little bit more of a wild west kind of thing happening, and that actually makes it more interesting. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, you know, the creative process is not just limited to writing songs and making records you you know you could argue that there's a creative element in releasing a record sharing a record doing all this stuff so it's, it's a little bit of that kind of wild west mentality and it's kind of fun to try to figure out how to get the music out there and and how to connect with your fans and it's kind of um it's it's like an open range you know and and you know there's some interesting things happening but um you've got to just like sort of uh, like I guess like in the tech world, mm -hmm. you can't be um, you can't hold on to one particular way of doing it because you'll just get get left behind. And you guys have been successful in uh, Justin getting the old tap on the shoulder. Are we getting are we getting the, the wrap up? You're five minutes. The old tap on the shoulder. So what I do want to do, and so just so you know, so I'm not being rude to you, and I'm not it seeming like I'm I'm bored or anything. I'm going to pull up our Facebook page and oh. to see if we have any exciting questions for people. So if you have, if you're watching this on our Facebook page and you have any exciting questions, any good questions, we encourage you to post them in our Facebook page right now and we will. Are we actually live on Facebook? We are. Prove it. So you can see right now, let's read, let me read some of the comments here. So, you know, we see a lot of the comments. When are y'all coming back to Johnson City, Tennessee? Hi from Virginia. Um, we you got have, one that said... Uh, you have wide range. We do have one that said, yes. what's your favorite song to perform live now? this stage in your career, favorite songs to perform? Um, I love playing Sad But True, because uh, I can play it different every night. It's, it's, I have a lot of, there's a lot of flexibility in that one. That's one of my favorites, absolutely. Johnson City. I remember Johnson City, I think, on the Black Album Tour. But I'd love to go back there. Just, we got to get invited. Well, we're, we're, and this is an example of how the digital world changes. So we're an Atlanta TV station, but we're getting comments from Michigan, from Johnson City. And I know you guys are going to Detroit later. So it just, 
it makes the world smaller, but it, you know, in some ways it, it's, I guess, challenging for you guys to kind of, it's easier for you guys to reach everybody, but at the same time, it presents a whole another set of challenges. Yeah, I think the main thing that you've got to do is you have to, you have to accept the things you can't change. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, you accept that this is the way information travels now. Mm -hmm. So that's all good. And then we just make the most of it. And you guys, like, you mix up the set list. I think you personally are heavily involved in mixing up the set list. So the people that maybe have snuck on YouTube and seen your concert from two nights ago in Miami can be assured that tonight's show in Atlanta is going to be different than the show that you did last week or the show like that. How much extra work does that take for you? And is that something you would do anyway? We haven't played the same set list is since 2003, I believe. Uh, so what's that, 14 years? Um, you know what? Ultimately, I mean, there's so many fans that travel everywhere we're playing, and so you want to mix it up for them. And for us, um, it just keeps us on our toes, keeps it kind of interesting and mixed up, and, and it, it's more, um, it's just more fun to kind of not play the same thing every night. Is that a lot of extra work for you to kind of go in there and figure out, okay, we haven't played this long in Atlanta in whatever number of years? Yeah, I have, uh, I have a whole, uh, you know, like sports team have stats. Yeah. I have like a whole thing of here are all the concerts we've played and here are all the songs we played in those cities and in Atlanta the last time we were here in 2009 or whatever we yeah. played these songs and so I'm gonna play four different songs and what I did back back then so it's there's a lot of, of that kind of stats yeah so as I was walking up to SunTrust Park today I see a lot of people this is kind of a strange question but I see a lot of people um, with tattoos and their Metallica shirts and long hair and whatever you don't have any tattoos do you? Uh, I have a mosquito bite, uh, and I have um, a bunch of hardware here. Uh, somebody in meet and greet just gave me this one, but I have no, uh, I have no real tattoos. I have a okay. Does this qualify a tattoo of a vein? I don't think that qualifies. So why haven't you chosen to get any tattoos over the years? Um, I've never really thought about why I haven't. Uh, it's just the idea of somebody. Uh, sticking like needles in me with leaving permanent ink spots on me just seems uh it's sort of like i don't know why don't you eat coal or uh why don't you uh jump off the top of the empire state building it just doesn't seem like within the range of um of uh sort of what i would call like normal behavior uh but no disrespect of course to all people that have tattoos but uh it's just not for me now music remains one of those those venues I'll take the normal behavior part out of that. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be offensive, but the tattoos are not for me. Exactly, I don't have any tattoos either, and, and, but you know, members of your own band. So why do you not have any tattoos? I, you know what, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure, I never really thought about it, same answer as you. So um, music remains one of those venues where you can bring people of all different uh, views together. So that's rare in these days and, and especially like we mentioned in news people tend to choose news sources uh, that that kind of reflect what they already believe but tonight in the in the crowd at SunTrust Park here I'm sure you're going to see lots of people that have differing political views do you have that same sort of dynamic within your band and um, what do you think it is about music that people can kind of put, put aside all these views whereas they can't do it in other aspects of their life well, I'm not sure that it's not in other aspects, but I, I think that you know whether you know if you go to a if you go to a baseball game, I'm sure there's you know 50% that think this way and 50% think that way, or a third that think this or whatever. So I mean, anytime you put a large congregation of people together in the same spot, obviously you're going to get lots of people that think lots of different ways. Music, you know, is certainly at the very forefront of bridging those divides and we're happy to travel all over this beautiful planet and play music for anybody of any particular world out view that uh, want to come and share it with us uh, but it's not um I, I think i mean you know even in this room right now there's probably many different opinions about you know i don't know tattoos or yeah. whatever else so it's uh, i mean that's just human nature so you got to celebrate that but you know music certainly is is obviously one of the main uh, tools to bridge those divides and um, create awesome escapes uh, for for you know and unify people. And on that note, we're getting the wrap up. So Lars, thank you for coming to Atlanta. Thank you for having us in Atlanta. Any final words for the people who are watching right now on Facebook and who will watch us on YouTube and on Eleven Live? Uh, tattoos, whether to get them or not, that is tomorrow's forum right here 
on Channel 11 in Atlanta.